Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. It's time for another edition of the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson, myself, Rick Weist, as we broadcast from the studios of Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Stacy, I'm thinking winter is wearing on, so it's time to talk tropicals and things tropics. And for me... Um, I really don't like the word houseplants because houseplants sounds like the plants are captive, <laughs> like they're under house arrest. So I'm going to refer to them as indoor tropicals. I like it. You know, another thing that we used to say is no plant is native to your house. <laughs> yeah. So houseplants is a bit of a misnomer that indoor tropical plants is a really good way to put that. Very good. So I like indoor tropicals and outdoor tropicals. And we'll kick things off right off the bat for our listeners and our viewers on YouTube that, uh, Stacy, I'm sure you've had the same experience. People struggle with watering. And my tip right off the bat, and I have used this for years and three times in the past week, I have had people ask me for advice on watering their houseplants that were struggling. And these indoor tropicals were not having a lot of fun. And I asked them, how do you water? And every one of them said, once a week, just a little bit. Oh, no. <laughs> Big mistake. Now, when you do that, generally what happens is the roots in the upper portion of the pot remain wet. The roots in the center of the root ball and at the base of the plant are dust dry. And you start to see its effects on the plant. So again, I believe that when you water indoor tropicals, your best bet is to water when they need it, water thoroughly, and then let them dry out between waterings. Would you agree with me? Yeah, I, I would agree. And, you know, it's hard to generalize a bit because there's such a huge range of houseplants. Yes. You know, even five, ten years ago, you didn't find half the houseplants that you see now. Yes. Certainly, you know, I think a great example of that is Spathophyllum or Peace Lily. Now, there's a plant that you should definitely let dry out before between waterings. Let it will. Let it will. And it does so dramatically. Mm -hmm. It definitely lets you know that it needs water. And it's none the worse for the wear when you water it. Um, so, yeah, I do agree that the pot... It, generally speaking, should feel light. If you lift it up, it should feel light, like it needs water, like it's it's fairly dry. There are, of course, exceptions, but the people who grow those exceptions, I think they know generally what they're doing well enough yeah. uh, that they're they're taking care of those on their own. But I think I agree with you that people make growing houseplants way too hard. They care for them way too much. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this an awfully long time, as have you, and I think we can both attest to the fact that we've seen more plants die from overwatering than underwatering. Exactly. Exactly. And watering based on a schedule. Now, I also love cash pots, decorative pots that will hold your plant, but you put a good drainage pot, a grower's pot is what I like to refer to it as a, a pot that has good drainage holes in the base. Slip it inside that pretty cash pot so that you can remove it from time to time. You can see how the plant is doing or if you need to clean or if you're over watering. I'm a big fan of cash pots. Well, you know, a lot of people are hearing you say that and they're thinking cash money. Yes. Uh, but actually the word is C-A-C-H-E yes. and it comes from the French verb to hide, cachet. So uh -huh. you can think of them as pots, cash po or cash pots, that hide the grower pot or simple plastic pot that's inside. Now, I think there's a couple of great things about cash pot or, or cash pot. First is that uh, you can take the plant out and water it in your kitchen sink, let it drain out, and then put it back in there, and you don't have to worry about rings yes. forming or anything like that. It looks way better. And if your plant dies, which does happen, and I'll tell you, if you're out there saying, don't tell me about how this plant's dying, I feel bad. We all kill plants. It's not a big deal. It's a great opportunity to try again with something new. Well, my word, if you haven't killed any plants, you're not trying hard enough. That's for sure. I kill a lot. It's okay. I, I'm all right with it. Uh, but, you know, the nice thing is it doesn't go away. So you can buy a new plant. Stick it in there. Now, I think the problem comes when a lot of people go shopping for houseplants, see those cute cash pots and say, oh, I'm going to repot into that. Yes. But if the plant, if the cash pot does not have holes for drainage, it is strictly a cash pot, a hiding pot, not a plant, not a pot to grow your plants in. If there's not drainage, you will kill it. 
I agree. I agree. And then, of course, we move on to humidity. The other day, I looked up tropical. I looked up synonyms for tropical. And the synonyms were sweaty, steamy, equatorial, hot, lush. And that does not describe our indoor living environments here in the great north during the winter time. As a matter of fact, move that plant away from that heat register that's spewing that dry, hot air. You know, it's true. There are so many plants that people love and then they get very frustrated that it isn't doing well because it's getting hot blasts of air from their heater. I think a great example is Norfolk Island pine. And Adriana, our producer, is expertly growing a beautiful Norfolk Island pine. And whenever we talk about it, it's it's because she keeps her house cool and she keeps the Norfolk Island pine away from those blasts of hot air. So even though they're tropical plants, they don't want those blasts of hot, dry air at these unexpected times. It's better to, especially in winter, have them cooler and getting fresh, fresher air like by a window or something I like agree. that. I agree. Think synonyms of tropical. And then two real quick things, Stacy. Uh, clean the foliage. Uh, what I mean by that is dust it or maybe some nice warm water, but I'm really not into leaf shine for houseplants. I mean, there's something oddly satisfying about it. Oh, I will, is. I will say that. So. I will use some Miracle Whip. Boy, does that Wait, make what? a great leaf. Oh, get out! You Lord. are not being serious I'm right now. I'm being serious. Try I mean, Miracle don't forget, Whip. this is radio, so people can't see your face. I, I don't know if you're joking or not. <laughs> I'm serious. You use you you wipe Miracle Whip I on your plants. I have from time to time. Wow. I don't recommend it if you have pets because it makes it <laughs> tasty for the pets. Pets or children not recommended i've never heard that before and i guess i've never looked at the ingredients on a can of leaf shine it very well could just be a, an oil emulsion like uh like miracle whip or mayonnaise is um, i'm not it, advising it uh, <laughs> well if you're having company and you just want to give your plants exactly. a little spruce up and you yeah. don't have any leaf shine just yeah. open the fridge little deviled eggs, a little leaf shine, you're, you're all set. I have not heard that before, but, you know, I do like leaf shine. I, I think um, it depends on the kind of person you are, but you're right that it is um, not good to have very dusty houseplant leaves because they can't photosynthesize effectively because exactly. the dust particles literally uh, block the chloroplast, the, the, or, the organs that help to photo, the plant photosynthesize from receiving light. Mm -hmm. So it's a really simple physical barrier that's easy to remove, whether you use, you know, a damp rag or apparently Miracle Whip. I'm going to put on the website uh, some of my favorites. Uh, let me quickly mention Calathea. I love Calathea. Uh, any Monstera, Monster Mash or the Rapidophoras, the, the philodendrons that have the holes or the slits mm -hmm. in the leaves. We call it leaf fenestration. And there's a lot of theories among people as to why the leaves have holes in them or slits. Like maybe they can handle the hurricane winds, which is ridiculous, actually, in my opinion. And uh, I have a theory on that. We'll share some time. Alocasias, philodendrons like Prince of Orange, and even the simple pothos. Some people call it devil's ivy, but pothos. It's easy to grow, and there's great new varieties like global green or, or Cebu blue. And then, of course, the 2023 houseplant of the year, um, feeling flirty, Tradis cantia, easy to grow. Very easy to grow and very versatile because not only does it look great indoors, it looks great outdoors in a container, exactly. and then you can bring it indoors at the end of the season. So it's a, a good two-for-one there. Exactly. Our word of the day Boy, Stacy, this is a tough one for me. Anthropomorphize. Anth Anthropomorphize? Thank you. See, I knew she'd get it. I knew she'd get it. Say that one more time. Anthropomorphize. Thank you. So it's to attribute human form or personality to something that is not human. Do you talk to your indoor tropicals, your houseplants? We're going to talk about that in our fourth segment today, Branching Ooh news and uh, giving human form or personality to your plants and talking to them similar to how you would talk to a computer when it's just not cooperating today. I've done that too. Yeah, I probably talk to my computer more than my plants, but that's more out of frustration. My plants don't frustrate me. Frustrate me. My computer, on the other hand, that's a, a different story. And along with this segment, go to our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We have this beautiful Gardening Simplified catalog, and I was reading through it the other day. There's all sorts of plants in there, Stacy, that are great for 
zone seven and warmer, great opportunities for us to, uh, to utilize those plants like in our landscapes this summer. Definitely. Uh, that's one of the things it's intended for is to help people find the plants that will do well for them and use them in a way that accentuates their home landscape. We try to simplify gardening. We'll do that in the next segment with Plants on Trial. You be the judge, you be the jury. Stacy will put a new plant on trial, and that's coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I'm Stacy Hervella, and I am joined in the studio with Rick Weist. And this is the time of the show where we put a plant on trial, which is to say that we pick one of the 320-plus proven winners color choice shrubs, tell you all about it, and you get to decide if you're going to put it in your garden or not. Sounds like fun, and you usually have a theme in mind. Stacy. what's today's theme? I do have a theme because otherwise, how am I going to pick? There's so That's many right. plants to pick from, so I try to <laughs> you know, pick up on something current or in the show already. And since Valentine's Day is coming up, it's just around the corner, and I, I dug into Grandma's holiday jewelry box I love that. for another, for her only Valentine's-themed pin that was in her holiday jewelry box. If you're listening at Christmas time, I wore a bunch of her Christmas jewelry, so now I have a dozen roses brooch that was her... Uh, her Beautiful. Yeah, it's interesting. It's very different. You rose to the occasion. <laughs> a dozen times. So anyway, today's plant on trial, fittingly with Valentine's Day, is Happy Face Hearts Potentilla. Like so, it. you know, obviously that makes sense. Hearts, Valentine's Day, I could have gone with heart-shaped leaves and picked Midnight Express Red Bud, which is a new uh, Proven Winners tree that you'll be seeing soon. But I wanted to go with Happy Face Hearts, not just because of its name, but because it is also one of our hardiest flowering shrubs. And here we are in the middle of February. People are thinking, you know, gee, it's been really cold. I know there was a deep freeze, you know, through the Northeast last week. It's a little bit warm here in Michigan right now, but, you know, there's been a lot of really cold temperatures and people start to worry, are, are my plants going to be okay? And I will tell you, if Potentilla is among them, you have nothing to worry about. I agree. I, I have often visited the Twin Cities in Minnesota. I think it's a code requirement in <laughs> Minnesota to plant Potentilla. I have also been in Canada, in Alberta, yes. Canada, and it was very popular in the landscaping there. And, you know, both of those uh, stories go to show that this is not just a very, very cold uh, tolerant plant. It's a very tough plant. It's very, very durable. But all that said, if you're sitting there thinking, well, gee, it must not be that great looking if it's so tough and cold hardy. It actually is. It I, is. I have, I know when I started here um, at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs about 12 years ago, I didn't think too much about Potentilla. It was just kind of one of those things that was you know, around. Yeah. And we had a happy face yellow uh, Potentilla uh, just outside our office door. And that thing did not stop flowering. It flowered nonstop from May until October. And not just like, oh, there's a couple of flowers on it. I mean, covered. It was really, truly remarkable. Now, um, it is, a, because as a lot of uh, cold hardy plants are, it's not very heat tolerant. Um, but in areas like here in West Michigan, if you have that milder summer, this thing never takes a break. It just flowers and flowers and flowers. Which is great. And we should use more of it in our gardens. Of course, the plant uh, we often see in industrial areas and parkways, uh, that sort of thing. Because as you mentioned, Stacy keeps blooming and is very, very uh, cold hardy. So the plant kind of gets a bad rap, right? Because of that? It, yeah, because it is ubiquitous. Some people have called it a gas station plant. <laughs> and, you know, it's <laughs> there's some truth to that. It is frequently planted at gas stations. But rather than be, you know, repulsed by that, you should learn something from that and say, hey, if this can survive, you know, on a corner by a streetlight with all the exhaust and the salt and the plows and foot traffic and everything, then it's going to do pretty well in my yard where it at least gets a little bit of TLC. Yeah. I, uh, if I can just quickly interject, I call it amusement park plant because I see it <laughs> in amusement parks all the time. As a matter of fact, I think if you go to Cedar Point and you ride the Raptor when you're in the inverted position, it's either Hypericum St. John's okay. wort or Potentilla underneath there. Well, I would suggest if you've noticed it multiple times, it's probably the Potentilla because the St. John's wort, which is another great looking plant. We'll definitely cover that one. Yellow flowers yep. uh, does have a shorter bloom time, yes. whereas the Potentilla is pretty much always in bloom. So what makes Happy Face Hearts Potentilla special 
is, it gets its name because it has candy pink flowers. Really nice, beautiful pink flowers. They're much larger than conventional potentillas, so other types of potentillas that you might find. And each petal kind of has a little cream, white, or yellow streak. Now, it depends on the temperature. So when it's forming flowers in cooler weather, like in spring, you're going to see that have a really nice yellow color. And if it's uh, getting a little bit warmer, you're going to see that kind of fading more into the white range, which is totally normal. Potentillas, uh, you know, have a bunch of different pigments, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, that impacts the the intensity of their flower color. And one other reason that I picked Happy Face uh, Hearts Potentilla is I didn't want to cover a rose for Valentine's Day. That was too predictable. But <laughs> Potentilla is in the rose family. It's closely related to roses, as are apples. I didn't know that. And if you look at the flowers, especially on Happy Face Hearts, they do look like sweet, perfect little apple blossoms. Yeah, they do. Yep. Interesting. I did not know that. So, you know, I always find a tie-in somewhere, mm-hmm. somehow, best I can. Very good. So, uh, Happy Face Hearts Potentilla was developed right here by Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs in West Michigan. And what we were looking for, you know, we it, it's a standard for us ever since we introduced Happy Face Yellow, which actually is the variety that gave the Happy Face series of Potentilla its name, because the yellow is such, and the size of the flowers are such that it looks like that classic yellow happy face, happy you know, smiley oh, face. Yeah. So that's where that came from. Um, but what we're always looking for is big flowers, nonstop blooms, and we wanted to find a non-fading pink. Now, if you've ever tried, if you've gone to the garden center in spring, fallen in love with an orange or pink potentilla, and you said, oh, this is gorgeous, and you planted it, and it was looking good, and then the heat starts coming on, and next thing you know, your plant is white. Now, it's fading. Yeah. It did not revert it just uh, is, is no longer blooming in that color, but it's a temporary state. So, and, and I'll say this again and again, because this is so important for people to understand, um, plants synthesize their color pigments at night. So when the weather starts to get hot, they are less uh, effective at synthesizing those pigments. And what happens is that the flowers fade. And you see this on all sorts of plants. But on the pink and orange potentillas, it can be quite dramatic. And it doesn't mean that you have, you know, nighttime temperatures in the 80s. It really can even happen for potentilla because it is such a cold tolerant plant. Even like when nighttime temperatures are in the 60s, daytime temperatures in the high 80s. But it does come back. It's a temporary situation. So when we are evaluating potentillas here, we're looking for plants that don't fade or at least are less likely to fade or need more extreme conditions under which they actually fade. So this isn't to say happy face hearts won't fade, but it's going to take a lot more of that hot weather to kick in before you do start seeing those nice candy pink potentilla flowers starting to fade out a bit. That pigment issue, Stacy, very, very interesting. I'm going to drop that on some people at the next dinner party I'm at. <laughs> very interesting. All right, see if they invite you back after you do that. I hope they do, but, you know, I I, uh, I, I have a penchant for sharing unwelcome plant facts as well. So Let me let me ask you a quick question. When uh, you're, I've had years of experience in the garden center industry, when I see a potentilla, I think head shears or pruning to rejuvenate the plant what's your position on that yeah so it's it i do consider it a low maintenance plant overall but uh like rick just said if it is not sheared back or pruned or have the oldest wood taken out once it's mature so you're not going to do this the first second maybe even third year after you plant it but after it's been established a little bit you are going to want to take out that older growth What that does is it encourages that softer new growth, which is much more floriferous and much nicer looking. But the plant takes pruning very, very easily. So basically, you know, after its third year or so, you can make a plan to just get your head shears out, snip the whole thing back, fertilize it, water it, give it some time. And next thing you know, it will be none the worse for the wear. You've done a great job here, Stacey. You've sold me on the plant. Let me ask, like I always do, what about deer? This is definitely one of the most deer resistant shrubs that we offer. Wow. Very, very deer resistant. And that actually ties into the drought tolerance. So potentilla, once it's established, is also very drought tolerant. And one of the reasons it's so drought tolerant is it has these fine kind of silky looking hairs all over the leaves. And what that does is basically trap the water vapor and prevent the plant from drying out so much. And those hairs also make deer go blech 
when they try to eat it. Very true. <laughs> Literally, true. I've heard him say it. No, it's true. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and so therefore, they're less appealing to deer. So it's a two for one. You get the drought tolerance, you get the deer resistance, and you get a really great looking plant that blooms pretty much nonstop. Even if the flowers do fade because you're having an unusually warm summer, it's still blooming. The flowers just aren't that bright pink. But once those nights start to shorten up or shorten up and get a little bit cooler, you're right back to those pink flowers. So I don't know. I think I've made a good case for this plant. I think you made a great case. I'm sold. Great. So if you need to see a little bit more about Happy Face Potentilla before you decide to add it to your garden, just visit GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. You'll see pictures, you'll get a link to its uh, webpage on the Proven Winners Color Choice site and find out everything you need to know to add it to your garden. So please stay tuned. When we come back, we are going to be answering your gardening questions. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. We are about to open the garden mailbag, and this is the part where we answer your garden questions. But before we get to your garden questions, I have a question for Rick in the spirit of Valentine's Day. And that is, I'm wondering if you and your wife garden together. Well, I'll tell you what, she's an excellent vegetable gardener and loves farmers markets. Um, And, you know, I think that this is true for a lot of people. Um, Her approach to gardening is neat, organized, get out the tape measure and have equal spacing between the plants. And I kind of live on the wild side, born to be wild, odd numbers, uh, put the foot on the gas, you know, that kind of thing. And both methods, there's nothing wrong with, with either method, but I'm just giving you an honest answer. I mean, we lived in a home years ago where I planted up front in a very visible area, a weeping beach. I love Weeping Beach. I was amazed how much some people hate Weeping Beach. Really? They think it looks like a Dr. Seuss tree or And that's whatever, a bad thing? Or prickly pear <laughs> cactus or that, I, you know, whatever. So again, a lot of it comes down to taste uh, and, your, uh, and your approach. So uh, she loves gardening and is an excellent uh, vegetable gardening and herbs. Okay. That's interesting. And, you know, it's very interesting your answer to me because I would say my husband and I are the exact same way. We do garden together. We love gardening together. But he is a very much more organized, pre-planned, measure everything out, draw the line. And I'm just like, oh, just throw it in. We'll figure See, it out we're the later. Same. Yes. So, uh, you know, the good thing is when you garden with your spouse and you have those complementary opposite personalities, everything usually turns out okay because you serve as kind of a check on each other. So I guess so. Hopefully you have good gardening experiences with your Valentine as well. So what do we got from our listeners? Uh, Katrina sends us uh, some questions here. Considering relocating and would like to move somewhere warmer, won't we all? (laughs) Well, at least as winter drags on. So I can grow more, but not lose the ability to grow plants and trees. I grow today and the examples that Katrina gives us our apples or peach trees or berries. And so is asking what hardiness zone we would recommend. And then also if you were to pick a state or a hardiness zone, what would you pick? Oh, go okay. So I will res- restrain for a moment from answering that last part because I've got an earful about that. I do too. But my answer for Katrina in terms of, you know, balancing the need that the fruits that she mentions, like apples, peaches, pears, plums, all of those things, those all have chilling requirements. So you can't necessarily just move to a very warm climate and grow them. They need some exposure to winter chill. Mm -hmm. So I think the ideal climate for this type of fruit is probably about USDA zone seven. What do you think? Total agreement. Um, and, And the problem that you run into when you get into the little bit warmer zones than what we have here, let's say along the lakeshore of Lake Michigan, is that if spring comes early and things warm up and then we get a cold snap, you lose those flowers. Yep, exactly. And we're blessed, for example, here in Michigan, especially along the lakeshore where spring is kind of late to arrive and we don't like that, but it's actually good for the trees. Yeah, and you know, we do sometimes have that risk though where we get that warmth and they come and the trees start to come out and then blammo frost. So I'm saying, blammo, (laughs) uh, like a a USDA zone seven, like North Carolina, they tend not to have those, you know, sudden frosts. Like when spring comes, it's usually there and sometimes it does happen. So there is no 
you know, cure all for that. Mm -hmm. But in USDA zone seven, I feel like you're really getting the best of all worlds. You're getting enough winter chill, but you're getting faster ripening. So you actually can get a crop of a lot of these things and expanding it into, you know, a lot of different fruits that you might not be able to grow in such cold climates. Like zone seven, I think is kind of that cutoff where it's not too hot to grow the cold stuff and not too cold to grow you know, warmer stuff. So I, that would be my ideal for, for these stone fruits and berries like Katrina describes. Well, I'm in total agreement, uh, Stacy, and I'm going to let you go first as to where you would move. So I would say like my dream would be probably somewhere in California. I mean, come on. Uh, you know, basically I'm thinking in Northern California, there's an area that they call the banana belt where it's still very cool you know, in terms of the summers, it's not really, really hot, but they also don't have hot or they don't have cold winters. So you can actually grow bananas, not, not tropical bananas, hardy bananas from Japan. So they're not going to be yeah. like a Chiquita banana, right. but um, so it's kind of like the best of all worlds. But on the other hand, when I really, really think about it, I'm thinking San Diego because I also, my dream would be to have avocados and citrus and um, proteas, which are a family of plants from South Africa and Australia that are just absolutely breathtaking. You see them in flower arrangements. Yes. Yeah. They're yeah. often sold as a cut flower. Mm -hmm. The plants are just oh, so amazing. So, uh, you know, San Diego, I would say, would probably have to be my pick. What about you? I love hot weather. I love hot, humid weather. But as far as being a gardener, I, the first spot I'd probably pick, Virginia. Virginia. I, I'm a big fan of Thomas Jefferson, Monticello, uh, and Virginia is probably zone six, seven. Probably somewhere at least zone seven, area. I would say most of Virginia. Yeah, I would yeah. think so. Uh, but but again, uh, Oregon into yeah. Washington, British Columbia. I fell in love with British Columbia. Just so so beautiful. My struggle with that area is, is winter and the clouds and and all the rain. But if I could survive that as a gardener. I'd love to live there. Well, it doesn't surprise me about Virginia because that would be combining your love of history and gardening. And there are so many cool plants yes. from Virginia as well. In fact, if you know botanical names, you will soon realize that a great many of them are named, you know, ex Virginiana or ex Virginianus because so many of the plants were, were named right. that came from that area. So a wonderful place for native plants as well as for gardening. A little bit of powdery mildew issues sometimes, though, in those humid climates. Yes, you know, you take the good with the bad. I, I fell in love with that area, zip lining through tulip trees, or I think Ooh. it's liriodendron. Yep. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Uh, giant trees and zip lining through them, just such a beautiful area. So, yeah, you're right, the combination of history and gardening. Probably right up my alley. Wait, now when you were ziplining, were you like, wait, stop. I want to see that tree a little bit. Put on the brakes. In the inverted <laughs> position. Hey, is that St. John's work? <laughs> All right, uh, what do we got next? Okay, sorry. Mary <laughs> writes, uh, two years ago, I planted two of the proven winners, Tough Stuff Red Mountain Hydrangeas. Way to go, Mary. Great plant. On the south side of the house, I fertilized them. They did not bloom except for a few meager flowers. I did not trim them this fall. They still have dead leaves on them. Should I prune them? Is this the right place for them? It's a sunny spot. Any suggestions? So uh, Mary, from her uh, question, I could tell she was in Michigan. Um, and so I would say that I would go ahead and give them a little bit more time before you decide to move them. The spot does sound like it's okay. And you've definitely done the right thing by not pruning them. Tough Stuff Mountain Hydrangeas bloom on old wood. And the old wood versus new wood thing is something that we don't have time to fully explain in the rest of the segment before we have to take a break. But we've got plenty of information about it. But it's essentially what that means to you as a gardener is that you do not ever want to cut these plants back because they pretty much always have flower buds on them for the current season or for the next season. So if you had cut them back in fall, which thank goodness you didn't, you would have been removing the flowers that it has for the coming summer. So um, how that those were being lost, I don't know. It could have been that they were browsed by rabbits or deer, especially if it was a smaller plant. It could have been that, you know, we've had harsh winters that you know, nipped the buds, on, on, no pun intended there. Uh, and, you know, another thing, people think so much that it's the winter cold that often takes out the flower buds on hydrangeas, but it's actually more often the spring. 
Exactly. That, you know, we get those, as we were just saying as about the fruit trees, mm-hmm. we get those warm days, March, April, it starts to, you know, make those, those buds open up, leaving the flower bud more and more exposed and then blammo. Get that, you know, Blam frost. Again. <laughs> Seems like we almost <laughs> always have a frost around Mother's Day. And then at, at that point, the flower bud is quite exposed and that can fry it. So even though tough stuff hydrangeas do have better bud hardiness, they're not immune and, you know, our weather can be unpredictable. But I love tough stuff. They and are beautiful. I, I would mention, Stacy, real quickly that uh, in my yard, they were pruned by the deer. Uh, and once I got them into an enclosure, they thrived. Did not prune them, and they're on the north side. You know, in Michigan, when the sun is low in the south in winter, the south side can be a pretty tough side. Yeah, it can be very, very exposed. So I would say since they're only two years old, give them a little bit more time to get established. The more established they get, the better they're going to be able to withstand any of these challenges. I think you did the right thing fertilizing. I would fertilize again come this spring. If we get some of those late season frosts in, you know, late April, early May, take a blanket, throw it over the plant just for the night that that frost threatens, take it off the next morning, and that should be enough to get it through. That way you won't experience blammo. (laughs) Well, if you have any gardening questions for us, you can reach us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And when we come back, we're going to be talking branching news. Please stay tuned. All right, folks, it's time for branching news. Not breaking news, but branching news. We don't make this stuff up. Here it goes. It was a somber Groundhog Day in Canada. Fred La Marmot. I'm going to guess that's how it's pronounced, Stace. Marmot. Marmot. Thank you. So Marmot, I thought it would be Marmot. I dropped the T. Anyhow, the beloved Groundhog who predicted weather uh, was found dead hours before he could take part in his annual tradition. So the Groundhog Day event in Quebec, Canada, began with music and dancing, but as it came closer for Fred to make his weather prediction, event organizers told the crowd of the Groundhog's death in life. The only thing that's certain is that nothing is certain. And so this year it's true. I announce to you the death of Fred. How sad. <laughs> that is so sad. Imagine being at that event and everyone's just like, oh, what do we do? I don't know. It was some bad timing. Poor Fred. I think they brought a little kid up on stage to make the prediction. And, uh, you know, I guess in Quebec, Canada, if they don't see their shadow, they they just predict six more weeks of hockey, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but Fred is uh, is gone. Actually, in Quebec, Canada, they would not see their shadow. They'd see their chateau. That's what they would see. All right. Give it to me again. Marmot? I think so. Fred Marmot. Okay. Very good. Well, Fred is dead. Uh, (laughs) Nick Castro, who runs Nick's Extreme Pest Control in California. He's been in business for 20 years. He had a shocking discovery of epic proportions. And I'm just going to paraphrase here. But, Stacey, uh, essentially, and this is a story you had shared with me, um, he started cutting holes inside the house and out poured hundreds of pounds of acorns. Unreal. It was nuts. It was a literal deluge. This was in uh, in California. The wall's completely full of acorns. Yeah, it is. You have to see the pictures because it is wild. And they do have out west these acorn woodpeckers Yes, that take acorns and they peck the hole and they actually store the acorn in it. So in, uh, out here on the east side of the, of the country... The woodpeckers, they peck into the trees. They're looking for, you know, larvae, grubs, that kind of thing. Uh, But in California, they're actually stashing acorns. And this poor woodpecker thought he was stashing an acorn, didn't understand why they were disappearing. He was probably like, oh, it's that dang, you know, woodpecker from across the street, my old nemesis. Mm -hmm. But they were actually going into the walls of the house. They are competitive that way. Acorn woodpeckers generally you see along the west coast up into Oregon and they are very precise when they drill holes into trees to press that acorn in tightly so someone else won't steal it. And this poor woodpecker had been working so hard but when the woodpecker would press the acorn into the hole of the house it would drop down in the wall. So I read in the story, Stacy, that 700 pounds of acorns were removed in eight large trash bags. That is absolutely wild. Mm. I'm going to put a link 
uh, on the website for you of uh, acorn woodpeckers because if you're not familiar with them, they, they almost have kind of a clown face. They're fascinating birds and uh, kind of fun to uh, kind of fun to study and to learn about and to watch in action. But Stacy, in a nutshell, this was an open and shut case. Yes, yes yeah, it was. But interesting. So there you go. Um, trees.com surveyed 1,250 people, determined 48% of people report talking to their plants. Of those who do, one in five say they speak to their plants every day. Two-thirds believe it helps them grow. And nearly one in four even say they have kissed their plants. Amazing. I... I, prob- I probably have kissed my plants more than I've talked to them. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Now, by and large, if you are a plant talker, the primary plant that you talk to are house plants or indoor tropicals. Yeah, because they're right there with you. But, uh, you know, no, I, it's for me, it's mostly been the outdoor ones where it's just like, oh, you're so beautiful. I'm also a tree hugger. You know, I can't resist a good tree I'm hug. I'm a tree hugger, too. I can't help it. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of people will play music for their plants. I think they're probably playing it for themselves in the garden. Uh, I had read a survey that classical music is most effective on the growth of roses. Again, no science behind this. Don't believe it. But it's fun to think about. And chrysanthemums thrive after just 30 minutes of music. So there you go. Well, it can't hurt, I guess, as long as your neighbors aren't getting, you know, blasted out or anything. I don't know. What, yeah, blast it. I don't know if you play Bette Midler, the rose, or tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree, or every rose has its thorn, but they seem to like music. So you're saying they want themed music. Themed Something music. Something they can relate to. Well, you know, my oh, next yeah. door neighbor, he does go outside and play his trumpet. He oh. has a trumpet. So when he's grilling in the summer, he's playing, you know, little concerts for the, for the neighborhood. And of course, my plants, which are right on our property line. And I have to say, they generally look pretty great. So, Well, there are a lot of studies that whether it's talking or music, it's the vibrations that the plant benefits from. Now, again, whether or not you believe it, that's up to you. Uh, I was at a tropical plant show in Florida, and there were students from the University of Florida who were doing that and wiring up the plants and trying to prove that these vibrations would have a positive effect on the plant. So... There's always that theory. Can't hurt. Can't hurt. So it was meant to be a new study by researchers at Michigan State University unveiled the first step in creating all natural medicines, replacing harmful chemicals, and the primary plant that they have been working with are mint plants. I love the guy who's working on this. He's fabulous. If you watch us on YouTube or you listen to the podcast, I love your name. I wish I had a cool name like yours, Bjorn Hamburger. Love that name. That's outstanding. And I'll bet you his students love him. But Professor anyhow, Hamburger? Professor Hamburger. I bet they love him. Uh, but anyhow, uh, genome clusters, and uh, they say that that uh, is what's causing these mint plants. Of course, mint plants are survivors, right? I mean, they have a tendency to be invasive. They are aggressive, that is for sure. They're aggressive. So you would think that whatever is within the mint species would go well towards fighting off, uh, let's say, mosquitoes, which is what he's very interested in, using mm. the mint plant to, uh, to deal with uh, mosquitoes. And Stacy, you know, you know me when it comes to, uh, to puns, I shouldn't even attempt here because with mint, it, it cannot be easier, like encouragement or make an investment or quite an accomplishment for those kids. Maybe they need an endowment for their, I'll stop now. <laughs> Mint's a good word for punning. All right. And then a statue believed to be ab- around uh, two, three, 2,000 years old has been found in Rome during repair work to a sewage system. The life-sized marble statue portraying a male figure dressed as the mythological Roman hero Hercules 
was discovered in a public garden in Rome during works to restore sewage pipes. It emerged face first as a bulldozer was tearing through old pipelines that needed replacing. An archaeologist in charge of the project uh, immediately intervened. And I would suspect that when they do major work in gardens or on roadways, uh, in Rome that they probably always have an archaeologist on site. I, I, don't, I think they can't afford not to. I mean, oh. there's, they're bound to, to find something. I don't think you can put a shovel in the ground in Rome without coming across a coin or <laughs> something. You wreck something like that, it's a monumental error. That's what it is. Statue of limitations. I don't know. I'm trying to think <laughs> here. <laughs> anyhow yeah so that's amazing to find something like that and i saw the pictures too and of course we always post branching news at gardening simplified on air.com so please go there and uh and take a look because these uh where do romans go to rent their vehicles oh geez uh you know it's it's hard to think fast on these rick i know it is hercules hercules oh hercules okay i got gotcha. you as Stacy has always told me, if you have to spell it out, it's not <laughs> it's a good probably book. Not a good, that, is, that is true, but you know, it's the end of the show, so I'll, I knew you go. had to get one last one. As in. a matter of fact, it is the end of the show, and it's been fun. We want to thank Adriana Robinson for her great work as the producer and engineer of the Gardening Simplified show. And Stacy, is always a pleasure to do the show with you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Rick. Likewise, and you all have a wonderful week ahead.